Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for those of us that are not on spring break yet. Um, so you were, um, I'm Stephanie Hurlick, and um, I'm the coordinator of the CSB assessment team. And you can see on your screen, we now have a full assessment team. So we're really excited about that. So um, Shelby Zimmerman is back, and she's now on the assessment team as the second TVI O&M. And then we have Rebecca Henry, who is our speech language pathologist and May Nguyen, who is our psychologist. So um, we just want to make sure everyone knows that we are up and running again as a assessment center. Um, we are um, up and running as much as uh, COVID is allowing us to, I guess I will put it that way. So um, we're doing a lot of consults for teams. So contact us if you have any questions that we can help out with. Um, we are accepting application packets um, on a pretty limited basis if you and we feel that we can do um, an, a remote assessment. So, um, but feel free to call me at any time and we can discuss options along those lines. And I am being reminded um, if you could make sure to put your name and the county you're from um, on uh, your screen so we know. So if you just go to the three little dots by your picture and you can rename yourself with your name and the county and that helps us out for our statistics. So um, the next slide. So May and Rebecca are going to talk to us about standard scores and what they mean. So we thought that this was a really important topic um, because I don't know about you, but as um, a teacher of the visually impaired, you know, and in all the training that I had, I wasn't really um, instructed as to what all of these terms often mean, standardized, um, standard scores and percentiles and, and age equivalents, and how do we use that information? And um, you know, often sitting in an IEP meeting and someone and the psychologist and um, SLP are talking about these scores, there have been times that I would pretend I knew what they were talking about. And often um, I didn't 100% understand it. So we thought it would be great if Rebecca and May could explain that. And also um, as teachers of the visually impaired to understand what we can and cannot, what we are trained to, assess and what we are not trained to assess. So um, sometimes I think that uh, TVIs, um, if we have not been trained in standardized testing, which I know that I was not um, in my university program at San Francisco State, we really cannot give standardized tests. So I am not qualified to give the Woodcock Johnson, the Wyatt, the key math. Um, and it's important that we know that, but we have a big role in that. And um, we have a role in working with the psychologist and the speech language pathologist as to how they should be giving those tests to our students so that they, um, all of the accommodations are made. And so um, we just kind of wanted to talk about that, help us understand that better. And um, I don't want to um, take up too much more time, but did I catch everything that I was supposed to catch, May and Rebecca? Yeah, thank you so much for that okay. introduction, <laughs> Stephanie. Appreciate it. And so, yes, we're going to start talking about what is a standardized test when we're talking about all these different mumbo jumbo scores that Stephanie was talking about a little bit earlier. So, a standardized test is a test that we can use to compare other kids or students to a group of other students their age looking or their grade. So the purpose of a standardized test is that it's given the same way, um, typically under similar conditions, the same instructions. Um, and so that allows us to compare the score. So, you know, a score, if we say maybe a student scored a five out of 20 on a test, 
we might not know if like that's a good score or a bad score because there's not a reference point. Um, so if a student who's in first grade gets a five versus a student who's in 12th grade gets a five on the same test, what does that mean? So these standard tests are created um, with a large group of students from across the nation who are representative of whatever age or grade level range that the test is intended for. And then we use um, these, <laughs> and I see the chat, and then uh, we, we use these standardized tests um, with our students. And because they have that uh, comparison group, we can say, oh, this score is you know, typical for a student of that age. Um, or if maybe a high score for that age, or maybe it's a score where we're seeing some concerns. So some of these tests when a school psychologist or speech language pathologist are um, giving it, it might be looking at expressive language, like how a student um, expresses their wants, needs, and ideas, or understanding language, that's receptive language, articulation, how different sounds make up the English language, or different areas of cognitive processing, how a student thinks and reasons with new information, their memory and different types of processing like auditory processing. And so the question that came in the chat is, um, the CSB have an updated list of psych assessments. I have one from 2009 and was told um, that it was several editions off, LOL. So yes, we are working on it and you're gonna get a handout at. Um, the end of this presentation, but also want to give a little teaser for our CTE BBI. We are doing another assessment tools presentation at um, CTE BBI, and we'll be having another valuable handout then. Um, but so times where you might see this standardized test come up is maybe during initial or triennial assessment of a student. And these assessments are really important because the assessments drive um, you know, our presentation of uh, present levels of functioning in addition to records review, interview observations, but then that information drives goals which then drives services. So we always wanna make sure we have an accurate view of students. And a lot of times it might be really confusing in the meeting because, uh, you know, we get so much into our groove of, um, you know, our different areas of specialty and we might, talk about all these different descriptive statistics and forget that not everyone has a background in that area like Stephanie was saying. So uh, we wanted to give a little bit information today about um, that. But first, we wanted to get some interaction for you guys because we know that learning um, sticks with you better if you are being actively involved. So true or false, and it's not gonna pop up in a poll. We just want you to give us, if you have your camera on, thumbs up for true, thumbs down for false, or you can just pop it in the chat or do a reaction button of a thumbs up or thumbs down, true or false. Test scores always show what a student knows and can do true or false and i'll let you guys kind of simmer on that and i see I thumbs see. down cindy yeah. thank you and i see an x thank you <laughs> appreciate you guys' reaction so yeah. and yeah you can also throw it in the chat if your camera's off we got two no's three and there's another false okay all right thank you for participating so this is, drum roll, false. <laughs> so thank you, Cindy and Alma and some other people who had given us a signal. Yes, tests are not always going to be showing everything a student knows and can do. It's a snapshot in time. And there's many factors um, beyond innate or learned abilities that impact the student's performance. So if a student slept well the night before, is hungry, uh, their level of fatigue or attention, their mood, their rapport with the examiner. Rapport is so important. Um, and there might be different environmental distractors. So maybe if you're on campus, the AC comes on and it's really, really loud because <laughs> the AC is in an old building. Or maybe there's different cultural linguistic factors that might be impacting the scores. and. Uh, and yes, very good point, Brian. Thank you for joining us. And ministers and parents um, need to be aware of this since 
these numbers, sometimes I feel um, when you're looking at a score report, you might say like, oh, this tells me exactly what a student knows. And I hope that, you know, whatever assessment professional you're going to will provide the information that, you know, it's just one snapshot of information. And we hope that when you're looking at any kind of report, you also take into consideration, or I hope the evaluator took into consideration that we never make a determination based on only one test or one score. And, you know, when you're looking at something like the WJ, you might read the manual or look at it and say, oh, this is so easy to give. The instructions are very clear. However, um, you know, anyone can read the manual, but it takes a lot of training to appropriately uh, administer and interpret the scores. And we want to see if the administration of the test is valid does it provide a helpful representation of the student's abilities or are other factors impacting it so that the scores should not be reported? And so again, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, we want to ensure ecological validity. We wanna make sure that the scores make sense in the context of everything else that we know about the student. So when we do a records review, interview with the student's educators and parents and observations in different settings, such as a social setting and in an academic setting, in an individual learning situation or in a group learning situation? Are we seeing that the different patterns that we're seeing in our test scores align with what we're seeing from these other points of data? And so to be comprehensive, our teams should be considering a riot ISIL model. So riot is records review, interview, observation, testing. ISIL is instruction, curriculum, environment, and learner. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Rebecca to talk about how do we determine if a test is a good quote unquote test to use. Yes. So not all tests are created equal. So in general, hopefully the report you're reading has considered all of these points, but we just wanted to mention some things that your that us as an SLP, a psych, and anyone else giving a standardized test consider before choosing one. So we want to make sure a test has good reliability. That means how consistently test takers respond to items and good validity. So is the test actually testing what it says it's going to test? Are you actually getting what the information that you're looking for? Um, we want to make sure that the norm group, which is the group of people that took the test and the test was then standardized on that group of people, that is the norm group. We wanna make sure that they are representative of the population. Was this normed on you know, 50 middle-class white children was this form, or was this normed on a diverse set of students? So score interpretation difficulties are going to arise when groups are not in that norm group. And unsurprisingly, in general, children with visual impairment are not gonna be in those norm groups. Um, and then the other thing we're going to look at is sensitivity versus specificity. You will probably never really need to remember these words, but just to keep it in the back of your mind, we're looking at tests that are sensitive enough to identify the disorder and specific enough not to over-identify, not to group kids in that don't actually have it. So we're looking for that comfortable ground of it'll pick up the kids without picking up kids who do not have it. Okay. Our next true or false question. A standardized score for a student with a visual impairment cannot be interpreted the same way as a standardized score for a student without a disability. So same as last time. Thumbs up. Again, down, chat. thumbs up. And thank you for uh -huh. showing us. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you. Thank you for putting it in the chat. I'm seeing lots of trues. Yay. And I think some people might still have their reaction on from their last question, yeah. um, but yes. So give a few more moments for people to think about. And yes, what about those adaptive skills? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. And that is part of you know having a comprehensive evaluation. We're not just focusing on one area of testing. We need to look at all areas of potential need. Thank you. And we'll get into a little bit about that. A little bit later as well. Um, and yes, Brian, thank you. Depends on whether the test was standardized with students with visual impairments. That is one factor that we do consider. And I think we're having a slowdown in responses now. So drum roll. 
It's true. <laughs> so standardized test scores um, were created by testing a group of people like um, Rebecca mentioned that serves as a comparison group for calculating these standard scores and percentile ranks and other statistics. And most tests, like Rebecca also mentioned earlier, they are not including students with visual impairments. Students with visual impairments are such a diverse group of individuals. So you can't just get like a few of them and say like they're representative of the whole spectrum of needs and abilities of students who have visual impairments. And it's really challenging since this is a low incidence disability uh, for people who make these tests to really have a strong representative sample. Um, so when we're looking at doing a standardized test, uh, a lot of times they'll look at different things to make the comparison group representative of maybe kids across America. So they'll look at age, grade, uh, geographical region, ethnicity, and social economic status. And sometimes they might include clinical groups, that means like students with different challenges. Um, but again, most of these tests that we're talking about right now that a lot of school psychologists as well as uh, speech language pathologists or occupational therapists or other testing um, examiners might use do not include our students with visual impairments, or if they did include students with visual impairments, the norms are really outdated. So they're really old. And what we know what happens over time with the Flynn effect is that um, the scores tend to, if you use an older test, it might be elevating it, elevating a student's performance. So um, that's why a lot of times these tests, you might ask like, why can't I use an old version of a test um, because they're renormed there, you look again at maybe the census or a different type of data point um, to make again a representative sample. And so the interpretation we have in the chat, the interpretation of such a test will tell you how different she or he is compared to a student without a disability, no? And very good question, right? And so I'm going to just quickly mention one of the resources that we will get to later on, but APH has a whole guidance document looking at whether or not we should be interpreting a test. Now that's kind of jumping ahead, but don't worry, we will answer <laughs> that question. Thank you. Um, so like I mentioned, it's really hard. Um, and this is where we lean onto our TVIs and O&Mers. Um, I like to say that my TBI is my best friend when I'm doing an assessment for a student who has a visual impairment because you guys have the knowledge of how impactful is the visual impairment because it can impact students to various degrees and uh, in different situations, the impact might be different. So we want to set up the testing environment to be optimal for our students to hopefully show what they can know. And we want to make sure that when we're assessing, we're getting meaningful data. So sometimes you might not get a score and you might just use that information to look at what kind of accommodations might be needed and use the information qualitatively, but that's getting a little bit ahead of myself in the slides. So here's the next true or false. And we'll talk a little bit more about scores. We will. So true or false, a percentile rank. And if you have never heard that term before, that is okay. Make a guess at our question. Percentile ranks are equivalent to letter grades, such as 90% is an A, 80% is a B, 70% is a C. What do you think, true or false? And I'm loving all the activity in the Ooh, chat. Right. Thank you so much for uh, responding nice and <laughs> yeah, asking all these questions. Got a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight falses. Some thumbs down. All right. Yep. And that is correct. They are not the same thing. We are going to get more into it, but a percentile rank and a percentage score, such as a grade, are not the same. So on our next slide, actually, we're going to dive into what some of these words mean. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Let's see if we can get the slide to load. Mm -mm. Maybe. What's it say? Oh, part of it. Well, we had a lovely image that does not want to load, but that's okay. We'll roll oh. with it. Yeah, shoot. I hope our other ones do. Okay. Um, so 
there would be a picture of a bell curve, which we'll talk about later. But these are the terms we're going to talk about. The two main types of scores you're going to see in a report, hopefully you have seen before, are standard scores and scaled scores. So we already talked a little bit about standard scores. That's how we compare a student's performance across different tests and between peers. So the mean, the average score is going to be 100, and the average range will be 85 to 115. So if your student has a score within 85 to 115, we consider them average. Anything outside of that is above 115, they're above average, below 85, below average. Usually these describe what we call composite or index scores, which is just a summary of subtests. So they might have rhyming and letter naming as subtests of phonological awareness. So the phonological awareness might be the standardized score. And we're gonna look at some examples of that later. Then a scaled score is often what those subtests are going to be using. A scaled score has an average of 10. So the average range is seven to 13. So again, these are usually, but not always the smaller subtests, um, but that's not always the rule. All right, and percentile ranks. So you would see them on our picture if they were here, but a percentile rank is going to show a percentage of scores in a distribution which are at or below the particular score. What does that mean? So a standard score of 100, perfectly average, has a percentile rank of 50. So it does not mean they scored 50% correct. It means they performed the same or better than 50% of the people taking the test, 50% of the people in that normed group. And, and so those percentage scales will be, no matter what score you get, you're gonna see what percentage of test takers they did the same or better than. And I appreciate all the questions that are popping up in the chat. Um, and so I did see a comment of Howard, that is not how parents interpret them. And yes, this is one of the reasons why um, we thought it was really important to do this topic. And we will give a handout at the end that also includes a handout that might help make it clearer for maybe teachers and parents of what these scores really mean. But thank you for you know pointing that out. And um, I did, I meant to throw this in a slide or so ago as well, but especially for you as a TVI, if you're reading a report and it's clear that your whoever wrote the report has not, didn't consider the student's visual needs specifically, that's really going to be an important role for you to step in and say, you know, we need to interpret these under the scope of their visual impairment. And Brian, thank you for bringing up base rate. We weren't planning to go into base rate since we only have about an hour to get through this, but if you want, you can feel free to unmute and um, share what you want about base rate. Uh, we were going to go into confidence interval, uh, but I can't, let me see if I can see you in my little squares. Oops. Um, feel free to unmute if you want to share your thoughts on base rate. And I know, uh, Dr. Leong, he is from a school psychology program from UOP. So I know he knows all about <laughs> all this common score mumbo jumbo that we're talking about today. <laughs> um, but before we move on. Yeah, it um, is I mumbo jumbo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go no ahead. Question. No, this base rate is not addressed too often. And um, it's just to be something, it's just like confidence interval. I think it's something that school psychologists must know but whether we explain it to parents or not, that's it's up to you because it's just so hard to try to explain confidence interval because as you're basically telling the parents that you don't really know what the real score is, <laughs> right? And then also <laughs> the base rate tells you how, how likely this is gonna happen in the general population or not general population, the norm example. And so both of those things really difficult to explain. So. I don't know if it's a matter of explaining it as much as that we need to know what that means. So that when we present the results, we put it into a into a, uh, a context that allow the parents to understand how fallible these scores are. You know, so I think mm -hmm. it's more for us than it is really for them because trying to explain confidence interval, forget it. It'll take you an hour and they still won't understand. And it's and it's and it's not necessary. You know, it's it's for us, not for them. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and so appreciate you being here. So, um, yes, I think confidence intervals can be really confusing. So when we're looking at standardized assessments, all tests of human behavior have some amount of error into it. Like, you know, if you're 
looking at a physical attribute like weight or height. You can measure it like accurately if you have an appropriate ruler or scale. But with human behaviors, it's a lot more difficult. We don't have a ruler we can just put onto someone's mouth and say, you have this level of speech skills. <laughs> um, so when we're looking at this, when we're looking at all the different types of error that might be involved, like the level of rapport, maybe fatigue or health on the day of testing, and also internal inconsistencies maybe within a question set of a test. So we provide these confidence intervals to kind of uh, provide for or account for the amount of error that might be possible. And so APH, the American Publishing House, their paper on intelligence testing recommends at least 90% confidence interval. That means um, we can say that with 90% of chance, this is the range of scores that a student would achieve based on the student's performance on this particular day. Uh, we recommend that 95% of the time, oh, sorry, American Printing House, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> um, we would recommend 95% confidence intervals. And so, especially when we're looking at students with um, visual impairment, our students are not included in these norming samples. And so we, we always want to make sure that if we do report a score, if you determine that it's appropriate to report a score, that we include these confidence intervals. So, um, and if you are an assessor, you might be familiar with Sattler and his books. These are kind of like the Bibles of assessment. Um, and he recommends that you use confidence intervals for the overall score and broad areas. Um, the different composites Rebecca was mentioning earlier. And so when you look at a confidence interval, you can look at it as like a band or range of scores that most likely includes a student's true score. And so, you know, these tasks when we're giving them to students with visual impairments, they provide estimates of abilities, but um, because of the diversity and range of students in our blind and visually impaired community, it makes um, it really challenging to say exactly, this is you know, how they compare to other students their age. And we need to take into consideration any different factors, which we'll go into in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oops. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, and we did have a comment in the chat about, um, age equivalence and um, yes, thank you Patricia. No one wants to hear their 10 year old is functioning at a three month level after years of intervention and school instruction. And we actually recommend that you do not use age or grade equivalence um, when you're writing reports. Different practitioners have different views um, and we'll provide a handout from the National Association of School Psychologists that also warns about the challenges of using age or grade equivalent scores. A lot of times people might look at these scores and think, oh, you are saying that my student is performing like a five-year-old or maybe performing like a student who is in the first grade, um, but that's not what these scores represent. These are the scores that if you're looking at the average raw score or the number of items answered correctly on a test, um, what was the average age for that raw score number or that I number of items answered correctly at a different age or different grade? So an example would be if Sunny performed on a test of reading comprehension um, and is said to have an age equivalent of six years, that means that Sunny answered the same number of items correctly as most six-year-old kids on this particular subtest. It doesn't mean that uh, she's performing as well or functioning as a six-year-old. So it's important to make decisions and interpretations about functioning using standard scores and not aging grade equivalents. But that being said, for our students, these standard tests, these standardized tests might not best capture all the meaningful information of how a student is performing. So even though today we're focusing on scores, usually I myself, I like to use informal measures to get more information about how a student is functioning. 
like using checklists, things like the organ. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later as well. Mm -hmm. But and yeah, let's take a few more steps. I just want to, I want to highlight what May said, though, is both of us are not fans of the age and grade equivalents. They're very misleading to parents. And if you want to know more about why, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to tell you all of our opinions on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are going to do a case study of a student May and I created. So basically, his name is Leo. We're pretending you just got his triannual report. So his SLP administered the comprehensive test of phonological processing. This is also a test a lot of psychs give, so it could come from either professional if you do actually see this test. All right, go ahead, May. So, so a bunch of numbers where I'm just gonna go through and kind of dig apart what you're looking at if you get this report in front of you. So Leo got a composite phonological awareness index score of 67. So we're gonna look at all these on a graph in a moment. He got three subtests that made up that composite score, which were elision, a scaled score of five, blending words, a scaled score of six, and phoneme isolation, a scaled score of three. Let's hope our image shows up on our next slide. <laughs> Yay, okay. okay. All right, so the star is representing his composite score, that's 67. So as you can see, that is quite below average. This specific graph actually shows it as significantly below average. You can just, if you Google a standard bell curve, you will find a bunch of different examples. And we're gonna give you a few resources at the end here that we like to use, um, just depending on what works for you visually. But you can see with the star that Leo is significantly below average with that 67. Again, 85 to 115 is the average range on standardized tests. So we also can see that he is at the first percentile range. We know this does not mean he answered 1% of the questions correctly. It means he scored the same or better than 1% of test takers that this test was standardized on. Okay, so now we're gonna look at those subtest scores. He got a five, a six, and a three. And the mean average of a skilled score is 10. So again, he's quite below average. Um, the average score range being about seven to 13, even his highest score of a six, he's gonna be below average. So what does this mean for you as a TBI? Basically, you will already know, obviously if he's having difficulty learning to read, but with some of these scores, when they break it down like this, you can see, okay, he is really struggling with phoneme isolation. You can really see, okay, he's almost average with blending words. So knowing what these actually actual numbers mean can help you be able to break down your students' specific skills and needs. All right, so this is one of the resources we have available. I don't, did you wanna show it, May, or just, just show it on the slide? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so again, this is the same bell curve, like we said before, all normal standardized tests are gonna follow that exact same curve that you can just Google but we will provide in our handout one that I think is really handy. It has some really nice, simple explanations and it's actually a great one to give to parents as well. Oh. <laughs> and then we have another one that we'll give you that's pretty simple as well. We try to find ones where there wasn't too many, there's a lot with many colors if you Google it. Um, but Here's another true and false questions before we go into depth into more of our resources that we'll be providing. So true or false, now that I've seen this presentation, I can give standardized tests. <laughs> what do we think? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, good answer. <laughs> false. Okay, and thank you for participating in our true false questions we want that to try is. to keep it lively <laughs> absolutely false nice job everyone but what it does mean is you can read through these reports and have some input of whether or not you even agree with if they interpret it correctly have some nice conversations with your slps and psychs and so what we're going to give you now in the chat and if you're watching this recording it will be in the youtube description box we created a quick little um cheat sheet handout with kind of very basic 
descriptions of the different concepts we talked about today. So I just drop that in the chat. It's a Google document and everyone should be able to view it. It has definitions for standardized tasks. And oh, one thing that we didn't describe in so much detail is standard deviation. That's okay. a measure of how spread out scores are on this bell curve when we're looking at a normal distribution. Uh, it also has a description about standard scores, scaled scores, percentile ranks, and confidence intervals. And if you scroll past that, you'll have uh, explanations of um, kind of reiterating what we're mentioning about challenges with age or grade equivalent scores. Again, Rebecca and I do not like to use them because a lot of times they can be misinterpreted. Um, so it's much better or more accurate to be looking at standard scores when you're trying to do a comparison to other kids within that student's age or grade level. And usually we use age norms. Um, the times where I see um, grade norms used is maybe if a student has been retained, but usually for um, different testing, academic, intellectual testing, cognitive processing testing, language testing, we usually use age norms. And beyond that, if we keep on scrolling, who should administer these tests? And so sometimes when I'm in different professional development um, webinars, if we have so many free ones lately, which is great, I see questions of um, TVIs asking, oh, so would I be giving the WJ or would um, the resource teacher or um, psychologist be giving the WJ? So it's in the handout, but I also just put it directly in the chat as well. If you go to page two of this special needs assessment user qualification guideline, you can clearly see who they um, are saying are qualified and permitted to provide or administer these different tests. And um, I do see a question about scaled scores. So if we go back, and thank you, feel free to throw questions in the chat. Boop, boop, boop. So on this chart, it doesn't have the scaled scores on them, but on different charts, you might be able to see it. But if we're looking at between 85 and 115, that's the average range, about 68% of our population fall within this range. So what that means is we expect most students or individuals who are given this test to score within that range. So 85 is equivalent to a scale score of seven and 15 is equivalent to a scale score of 13. Um, so when we were saying with this example for the student uh, where they're having a scale score of six, that means that scale score of six would be somewhere around here-ish. I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna annotate real quick. Uh, would be somewhere in this area. Um, and so clear that. Oops, sorry. So if we're looking at scores that are below a scale score of seven, that's where we might see some more concerns. Like um, if a student has a lot of sixes in a particular area, we might want to test more in that area or start thinking of what kind of accommodations or supports or services might be needed to address that area of concern. So I hope that makes it clearer on the question about scaled scores, but if it's still confusing, we can go more into it. Um, but basically, if you see scores below a standard score of 85 or a scale score of seven, so the reason why there's these different numbers that might be confusing for some people, we use standard scores, these scores of between um, the average range for these scores are 85 to 115. These are usually used for composites. When we look at all these little mini tests and put them together to look at a broad area of skill, we usually use standard scores. Different tests have different um, ways they represent their scores, but most of the time for um, overall cognitive scores or language scores, they use standard scores. For these little mini tests within a composite, they usually use scale scores. So that's when you get the numbers for the average range between seven and 13. So I hope that, does that make that clearer or still? Yes. 
And on the on the scaled score topic too, me and I were having a discussion about this earlier that seven is something to keep your eye on too. While it's technically within that seven to 13, that is the very bottom of average. And so if your student has a bunch of sevens, that's something you really want to go double check on that kid because they're just mm -hmm. barely average. Um, definitely an area you'd want to go double check. Mm -hmm. And let's see. In our school district, and I'm reading a question off the chat. Um, in our school district, they are wanting us to assess students with the KTEA, which is an educational assessment used for moderate programs. Is this something we can do or should we do? Um, so usually if I have a question about the test, I look at the manual because the manual usually tells you if you are able to, who is the people who are qualified to administer a test. And if you were not trained to provide the test, most likely I would say, no, you should not be giving it. So the WHA, even though, um, <laughs> and thank you for the comments in the chat. Um, we know our time is wrapping up. There's so much that we can talk about about this topic, but we'll try to wrap it up. Um, and I lost my train of thought. Oh yes, KTA. So, a lot of these tests, like the WJ, if you read the instructions on how to administer it, it might seem pretty simple. Oh, I just start my timer. I show this student this kind of um, page, and then they respond to it, and then I write down their answer. That seems fairly simple, but actually, the training for the WJ is it takes like a whole um, day. I think it was a day or two days. So, especially if you're looking at the academic, the achievement portion, the cognitive portion, and the oral language portion, each of those is a whole day of training. So if you haven't received a specific training, I would recommend that you defer to another assessment professional on your school team, where you might support them in showing them how it would be appropriate to accommodate. And so when we're looking at accommodations, a lot of times I hear people say like, oh, if I just make it bigger, is that good enough? And it's like, well, does the student typically use that kind of tool for magnification? If they're not used to using that kind of tool, then are you gonna be really tapping into that skill that you're trying to assess? Whenever you give any kind of test, you're looking at your results, you need to think, am I really meaningfully testing what I'm intending to test? Or am I just tapping into an aspect of their visual impairment? Like if a student is just learning Braille, and they are not familiar with maybe grade two Braille, using um, the Braille version of tests might not really give you accurate results because they are not quite so fluent with the Braille yet. Um, and I don't know if there's anything you wanna add to that, Rebecca, but there's lots of different considerations in terms of accommodations and I'll show you a resource in a little bit um, of what to talk about. With the, the KTEA in general, I was just, wondering if they were asked, the school district was asking the TVIs to give it. Um, Cause I would say that is abnormal. It's the Kaufman test of educational achievement. In my experience, that's um, a psych and SLP test. I don't know, May, if you have other thoughts on that, but. Um, or RSP or resource teacher, all these acronyms or special yeah. day class teacher, a special education provider who um, has been trained in standardized assessment. So it's not just getting trained in this one test also. Yeah. So anyone who is a school psychologist or a resource specialist, special day class teacher, occupational therapist, um, anyone who is a typical part of the role to be doing these standardized assessments before they even took their classes on how to give particular tests in their area of specialty, they should have taken a statistics class. And so there's a lot of training that gets involved just to understand, like this is a very, very brief and very um, kind of broad stroke of what all these statistics mean. Um, and if you're interested, there's lots of resources to go into more depth about them, but there's a lot of training that is involved before we even touch the different tests to make sure our understanding of different things like um, Brian or Dr. Lung mentioned the understanding things like base rates and understanding when it is appropriate to interpret a score or when to not interpret a score. So another resource I'm gonna bring up on the screen right now, and I'm gonna try to make it bigger, is intelligence testing of individuals who are blind or visually impaired. 
Uh, I believe this came out in 2011. It's a little while ago, but I feel like it's a really great resource for you to consider when you're thinking of supporting your different evaluation team members in their triennial or other types of assessments. So areas that I think might be areas where you get a lot of questions might be adaptations of thinking about what accommodations might affect the concepts that are being tested versus um, they are just providing access. In another area where I feel a lot of school psychologists come to me with questions is when should they interpret scores qualitatively versus quantitatively. So quantitatively means like, like using the numbers, using the scores versus taking information from the student's performance and using it to inform maybe the accommodations or level of supports needed to get the student to show what they know. Um, and it's not just whether a student has appropriate um, accommodations for light or for magnification or positioning. We also have to take into consideration language development and other areas of development are impacted by visual impairment. And it's not just one visual impairment is representative of all visual impairments. It matters when the onset of the impairment is. So if a student had vision up to age five, they might have concepts, visual concepts that help them to learn that a student who didn't have visual access when they were young um, might not have. And so a term that you hear a lot in this field is incidental learning or the learning that happens by casual observation. And a lot of our students who are missing that, their language development is different. So abstract concepts will be more difficult to grasp if they don't have hands-on experience with those concepts or even concepts like um, an island. If we're talking about an island and saying it's a land surrounded by water, a lot of us who are sighted, we see a picture, we can see the island, see that it has a tree and it has the ocean all around it. But for a student who's visually impaired, unless they walk around the whole perimeter of the island, their concept of an island might not be the same. And so there's definitely areas where students might be able to give you a definition because they have great auditory memories and are able to tell you, you know, a textbook definition of a concept, but they might have hollow language. They might not really meaningfully understand the concept. So that's also a difficult thing when we're doing these standardized testing is to, you know, probe and test the limits to see where their understanding really lies. And yes, I see in the chat, qualitative data is really hard to sell in a district that values quantitative data. But I have to say that, that we need to look at the spirit of IDEA. You know, we have to look at, we're addressing the individual unique needs of a student. And so the way that we assess students with visual impairment, is going to be different than how we assess a student who has a specific learning disability or autism. You know, there's different considerations that we take in, um, when we are preparing and administering and reporting and scoring for the different populations. And I know it's a hard argument, but I do believe with, you know, it's particularly when we're looking at students with visual impairments and they're learning on the expanded core curriculum, the ECC, not a lot of people know what that means unless you've been exposed to the field of visual impairment before. So I feel like with someone mentioning before independent living skills, you know, there's so much that you can tell from a direct standardized test, but having a student in real life demonstrate different skills, um, you know, either through teacher or parent report or observing them can be really meaningful because you know, sometimes these students might be able to really shine in one area. It's a little bit like Swiss cheese. They might have great scores or performance in one area, but in a practical area of daily living, they might need extra support or they might be used to waiting for an adult to do something for them. So it's really important that we also look at these things as well. And um, yes, and again, in the chat, yeah, I feel like we're kind of preaching to the choir here. <laughs> and we hope that, you know, that's part of the reason why we do these Tuesdays teas is to share more knowledge and hopefully, you know, influence the field to look at beyond the numbers. Whenever we're doing assessment for students with low incidence disabilities, 
we need to look beyond the numbers because the numbers only tell us so much and the numbers might not be meaningful for all students. Um, another handout I wanted to make sure we look at, this is the handout from the National Association of School Psychologists. Um, I feel like this provides a little bit more detail than our brief handout, um, but it, it might be helpful for if you are sharing with um, different members of your team, maybe your county TBI team, um, to help them better understand different scores that we're usually talking about in assessment reports. And it also has this nice chart. So one thing that we didn't mention yet, um, but it's important to know, different test manuals use different test score descriptors. And so it can be really confusing for anyone if you're looking at different tests and you see the same number, but there's a different descriptor attached to it. So when I'm teaching my students, I usually say, pick one set of descriptors and use them throughout a report, as it makes sense, um, for your assessment so that whenever you're referring to a number, the same descriptor is attached. But this is kind of what Rebecca was saying with the C top, a seven on the C top in the manual is described as below average. But when we look at the statistics, statistically, it falls within that range of the normal curve of one standard deviation or being uh, one uh, bar length away from the mean or the average. And so it can be really confusing. So what I would recommend to any team members is that try to get, if you're writing, especially if you're writing a team report, having everyone you know, adapt to one set of descriptors might make it more parent friendly so that it's easier to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about different tests. Um, but yes, I totally feel you, Patricia, the beyond the numbers movement, we need to look beyond the numbers. I feel like people can get so stuck on the numbers and you know it is just a snapshot in time and it can change. It like maybe, um, the fire alarm went off. We shouldn't have reported that score if the fire alarm went off, but some people still do. And it's like, is that a really meaningful reflection of that student's skill in that area? If maybe they got distracted when some sound went off. Um, and another handout I wanted to share out with you guys. We started, so someone asked in the beginning for a list of tests. So I started this little Q&A document and it's going to stay a live document what that means is I will try to update it over time. And um, it gives some really brief um, considerations. And I hope that if you are a lot of times school psychologists or your other evaluators will come to you as a TBI and ask, how should I test the student? Um, you can provide and share this document. It's welcome for anyone to click on and view. And I would advise you to try to ask them to read the beginning section before going directly into this chart of different tests. Uh, Cause I know people will probably just go to the chart and look at, oh, what test can I give? Um, so these are tests that are primarily um, administered auditorily. So if you have a student who is not able to access information visually, this might be one way to tap into different areas. And I did break it up based on um, CHC, um, different areas. So looking at verbal intelligence, fluent fluid reasoning, short-term memory, um, long-term memory, and auditory processing. Uh, and some of these tests also overlap with speech language tests. And so I included the age ranges. And for some tests, there's picture items at the beginning. So for example, the KBC2 normative update, um, the auditory only items are for ages seven and up. So um, hopefully this will be a useful reference for uh, your team, but this is not the only way to assess. At the end, I also have um, alternative ways to look at cognition. So for a student who might be um, having more intense needs, you might want to use different things like the Oregon project or maybe the, the BAME. Even though it's meant for a certain age range, you can still use it as a criterion reference tool to look at what the student is able to do, like how are they able to perform certain skills and note that qualitatively. Um, 
And there's also some links in our handout that um, go to different uh, guidelines for who can give certain tests. So I pulled up earlier the one from Riverside, which publishes the WJ and the Patel, but another large publisher is Pearson. And so they also, in the handout we gave, um, provide some different guidelines around qualifications for administering tests. So I don't know if we missed any other questions. I was trying to scroll through to see if there was any other questions that we didn't address yet. And feel free to unmute. We're a small group if you want to ask or have a comment. And thank you everyone for coming and providing your input and thoughts on this topic. Um, you know, it can be a little bit uh, dry when we're looking at all these different numbers, but oops, if you do have a question for a specific conf uh, assessment case or you're preparing for evaluation and you would like help in how to prepare, you can feel free to contact us, um, you know, we are the assessment center team for the state of California, so uh, we are here to provide consultation as well as assessment. Um, and like Stephanie said, we're trying to provide assessment as best we can in a, this uh, pandemic moment, but um, we're doing quite a bit of consultation. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out and our information is also on the assessment center website page, which is linked in the document. And do we have any questions or comments? Rebecca, comment. did I miss anything? Go ahead. That, that page is so cute right there. I just <laughs> <laughs> and just one little tidbit about the assessment their team. We love animals. It's us and our pets. <laughs> cute. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks. Thanks. It's a lot of information, but it was helpful to to hear it. Not that I understood it all, but I, I, I can get the overview. <laughs> and if anything stands out that we were either too jargony on or the handout's not clear, please reach out and we'll do our best to clarify. And yes, like um, Brian mentioned earlier, there's a lot more terms and concepts involved with standardized assessment that we didn't dive into today. I know we're already at our time limit. Um, so these are kind of the big terms that we wanted to share out, but there is a lot more involved. So there's lots of resources online and that we can share with you if you want more details. <laughs> well, thank you very much.